Two questions right off the bat. Who the hell is Wismax and what is an EH1 Mondrian? Well, Wismax is an Asia-based company that makes most PC parts, peripheral stuff, uh, really minus the expensive stuff like CPUs and graphics cards. But what is an EH1 Mondrian? Well, it's this case I sent over to me. It's inspired by the paintings from Nerve and P.A. Mondrian. I think that's how it's pronounced. I think particularly paintings like the good old now of copyright commission number two. A classic. What's good about this merging of cultures is they're both very um, blocky. You can get different color packs to mix and match the various glossy glossy glass uh, and matte plastic panels. I'm not quite sure about the finish and quality of the plastic panels though. I've just got the one and it's a little color patchy. I don't know if that's intentional but there we have it. There is a white version that's somewhat more white than the black version, which is also quite white, but also gets a muted panel color set that I think looks quite neat. I've got the black one here with the big white panel. I don't think Mondrian punched the holes in the white bits. So other than the link to the 100 year old paintings, what's special or interesting, or more pressingly, what's great and terrible about this case? Let's see. Starting at the end, I'll say right off the bat, this is a good case, but at around six and a half out of 10 final score, it's no better than that based on my findings through 31-ish data sets or data points. Well, we'll get into the full breakdown in a second, but let's cover the absolute basics. The EH1 Mondrian, or for anyone with dyslexia, the Mondrian is an ATX case with further support for EATX boards with the extra slots for massive board support. It comes with a pile of fans, three 140s up front, an ARGB 140 in the rear, and a 120 millimeter fan on a bracket to the rear of the motherboard tray, which is in theory at least interesting, but in practice it's about as effective as trying to breathe with a plate of steel in your mouth. I actually found removing the fan during testing stopped it from crashing for some reason. I couldn't tell you why it wasn't even CPU temperature or thermal paste related, so maybe it was shifting heat from the back of the board to the other components around it, VRM stuff causing them to be less stable? I don't know. The bracket it sits in is also quite poorly formed and fixed. Capping fans off, you get a fan and ARGB hub that links through to the front IO LED button for, usual, for the usual suite of lighting effects and fan speed control is handled by your motherboard and its BIOS. Other IO includes a solid suite of USB ports including Type-C and a full gamut of front IO buttons and lights. Another cool feature is the horizontal or vertical PCI Express slot orientation. It's really well designed and slots into either position with ease. Really well, nicely well done. You don't get a riser extension cable, but there are standoffs for a vertical riser cable. There's also a graphics card support bracket that can be fixed in loads of positions with great flexibility. Radiator support is strong with this one. You've got motherboard tray support for a 240 millimeter radiator, or you can plaster the front and subsequently the top and rear with radiators and likewise fans. Comparing the two intakes that are both filtered, the front getting a nice snappy magnetic plastic framed fine mesh filter and the side and top for that matter getting a magnetic strip perforated plastic sheet and before I get to the point the base filter is just ugh. It's a roughly perforated plastic sheet held in by tabs that's very inaccessible. Anyway, the front and side intakes, uh, which one is better? Well, area-wise, the front has roughly 10,500 square millimeters of intake without the filter and counting for six millimeter perimeter intake strips and four millimeter central strips of free area. Uh, and the side with its 456 five millimeter holes has around 9,120 square millimeters of intake minus the filter. So the side is about 10% off the front end area, but the front can take more fans. So it's the better option minus the filters. The panels themselves are a bit of a mixed bag. The top panel is solid with the decent filter all over really hugging the edge. The three millimeter glass panel is good and the ball and socket top connections work really well combined with the indent to the rear for grip. The other side panel suffers badly from a lack of edge returns. It just bends too much and doesn't want to give up the front socket connection until the bitter end 
every time. But the front is the really down point for the build quality. It takes quite a lot of force to be removed, which is the intended removal technique. But the first removal yielded a random piece of broken plastic and on subsequent removals, more and more plastic breakage occurred. The brittle choice of plastic, uh, the complicated design of the components didn't make for a robust component as intended. With the glass panels, it's not that rigid, but without the panels, it's very weak. What you're seeing now is the process of the panel swap if you wanted to change out with the colors of the different sets that you can buy, minus the plastic flying off if you're lucky. Does this sort of critique uh, encourage companies not to send me stuff? Uh, it makes me wonder how likely a company is to deny a reviewer product samples if they bear all to see. Either way, uh, it is what it is. Moving through the main install process, the motherboard installation was clean if you remember to set the right standoff positions twice. I installed it upright for better lighting and the standoff post made this relatively doable. The graphics card install was clean on top of that optional vertical panel position and they use very sensible standard screws instead of thumb screws which is just better in every way and I'll say it every time. Now it's time for the power supply unit which sits on a set of four small foam pads and length support is very depending on the position of the drive cage which can be in an almost infinite number of positions between 175 and 300 millimeters from the rear thanks to the slots in the base. That drive cage can take a couple of three and a half inch or two and a half inch drives and if you need more you can always use the two drive sleds on the back of the motherboard tray which are at least unique if not quite well executed. They've got a spring tension plate to the top which lowers and raises tabs that engage with holes in the panel. I like this idea. It's interesting and it kind of works. But if the holes were horizontal slots, I'd be more all in, but since they're holes, the circular nature of them, the tolerances are quite tight between both elements, so it gets stuck quite often. As for the cable management, well, since there's enough room for a bracket, a big bracket of that, and a fan, there's more than enough room for cables in the rear compartment. And since the CPU cooler clearances stand at 180 millimeters, this case is quite a bit wider than the usual at 235 millimeters. Anyway, there are grommets and cable management loops in all the places you need and a few Velcro straps to boot. So with all that said, how did it perform? First, I tested the full fan speed performance. So we'll be looking at the best temperatures out of the box and the highest noise output. Overall, the Mondrian does quite well thermally. Don't worry so much about the exact temperature as much as how high the cases are in the graph, as this is all based on score, which takes into account the temperature relative to the components maximum and minimum temperatures. There's a lot in the back end to calculate the stuff, but just stick with the position and you'll be fine. Relatively speaking, the CPU and GPU thermal performance is quite balanced, which is what it is, I guess. At full speed, the Mondrian is quite a noisy machine, however, so that performance does come at a cost. Moving on to the noise normalized testing, after turning the case fan speeds down to a noise output of 37.5 dBA at 40 centimeters from the front side of the case, its performance is roughly speaking um, average. Very much the same relative performance as the full speed testing, only this time it's equally noisy as all of the other systems being tested. Note the Mondrian's fans were at 1100 RPM for this testing instead of the 1600 RPM average speed in the full speed testing. So all of that is to say that the Mondrian has a relatively decent thermal performance score. It's not amazing like the Indolfi case that I've spelt wrong that will need a lot of work to change now, so just imagine it with an F for the time being but it's not terrible like the performance of the Johnsbow D40. So wrapping this up, the compatibility scoring is fine, nothing special at all, but it's not egregiously inefficient with many options for fans and radiators. This scoring in this graph is relative to the case volume and each item is normalized across all 300 plus cases in my spreadsheet. So it's a straight comparison to hundreds of cases on a level playing field, not just the ones you see here. That's one side of the compatibility score. There are also as a fan bonus score to be added. And since the H1 Mondrian comes with a mass of four decent 140 millimeter fans and a 120 millimeter fan, it gets a compat compatibility fan bonus score of 19%, which brings the overall compatibility with bonus score up to a nice wholesome 69%. The build quality in most areas 
wasn't outstanding, mostly average, so it gets a total of roughly 60% for that, but the installation scoring is great. Relatively, it's not amazing, it's middle of the pack, but in total it's at 90%, so it's still doing great. Adding all of those cornerstones up, the EH1 Mondrian is doing good, and considering any super special or horrific features, this getting a 5% bonus point score boost, equivalent to half a bonus point out of 10 if you prefer, for the graphics card support and the vertical PCI Express section option. For reference, the Fractal Terra I just reviewed got 10% bonus points for the spine of the case moving for multiple graphics card and cooler option, and the O11 Dynamic Mini got a 10% bonus point score for including three back plates. So I think the 5% is about right for an alternative graphics card orientation and support bracket for a total score of 71%, which is a solid score. But score is one side of value, price is the other. So how much does this thing cost? Well, it's not currently available in the US, but Wismax does sell some stuff in the US, so it might make it over there eventually, you never know. But it's definitely available in Korea now, and with the help of Google Translate, the currency in Korea is the one. Not that one, this one which is genius level of positive reinforcement. It's not quite on the same level as Great British Pound or Pound Sterling, but it's pretty good. Anyway, between the Nava and Danawa store, the settled, settled price looks to be around 109,500 Korean won, which is roughly speaking 82 US dollars. So the price versus total score ends up being super good at second from the top, the top being the best. If it does get to the US, then I wouldn't be surprised if it ended up being a little over $100. So it might reduce a little in value, but I can't see it being less than at least fine unless it was over $120. Anyway, I'm done. That was the Wizmax EH1 Mondrian. And yes, I'll get around to reviewing the Lancool 216 and H7 soon. Join Discord and subscribe and stuff to join these all of these guys in the credits. Um, there we go. Bye, guys.